Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. Uh, my name is Molly. I am one of the owners of Point Reyes Books, and I'd like to start by thanking our co-presenting bookstores, Diesel and Romans, uh, for co-sponsoring this event with us. It's really wonderful opportunity that these virtual events have presented that we get to work with other bookstores that we love um, from all over. So thank you so much. Um, so briefly, just to introduce Point Reyes Books, um, we are a small independent bookstore in Point Reyes Station, and uh, some of you might have had the experience of seeing Richard Powers in Point Reyes at the uh, Toby's Feed Barn across the way from the bookstore. We mentioned that just because we know it was such a, a touching and memorable event for so many of us. And we really wish that we could be doing this there, uh, that we could be gathering in person and all sitting on hay bales and get to chat after, but this is the next best thing. And uh, we're very glad that people can join us from far and wide uh, through through Crowdcast. Um, we also want to just give a quick thank you to anyone who caught the kinship event uh, that we did a few nights ago with Robin Wall Kimmerer and the Center for Humans and Nature. That was a really special evening, and I know many of you signed up uh, for this event after we mentioned it there. So welcome back to here wherever we are. <laughs> um, all right, so a couple of notes on uh, Crowdcast. I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. You'll see that you have the chat on the right-hand side. Feel free to use that throughout the event. Say hi, say where you're tuning in from. That's always fun to see. There is also the ever important link to buy the book at the bottom of your screen the whole time. I'll also put some links in the chat as we go along. And there's an ask a question button at the bottom of that. So you can use that at any point to submit a question for the audience Q&A at the end. It won't interrupt the conversation if you do it midstream. And I'll be able to see those and I'll uh, bring those questions into the event towards the end when we have about 10 minutes left to go. So use that ask a question button at any moment when you have a question. A couple of notes about our upcoming events. Um, on Thursday, October 14th at 7 p.m., poet Astur Atsuro Riley will read from his highly anticipated collection of poems, Herd Hoard. On Friday, October 15th at noon, uh, these are all Pacific time, artist Jackie Morris, who has collaborated with our friend Robert McFarlane on The Lost Words and Lost Spells, joins us to talk about her latest project, The Unwinding. And you can find more events and updates available on our Crowdcast page where you're watching here or by subscribing to our newsletter. I'll put a link to the chat in that as well. And um, we also hope that you'll stay tuned to your own local bookstore, uh, whichever bookstore that you came from. We are very happy to have you here. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, so we have Karen Joy Fowler here with us tonight. Karen is the New York Times bestselling author of six novels, including the Jane Austen Book Club and We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which was the winner of the Penn Faulkner Award and shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. Karen's new novel, Booth, will be published by Putnam in March 2022, and she lives in Santa Cruz, California. And Richard Powers, we're so happy to have you back. Um, Richard Powers has published 13 novels. He is a MacArthur Fellow and received the National Book Award. And his most recent book, The Overstory, uh, most recent before this one, <laughs> won the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. He lives in the Great Smoky Mountains. And we are so happy to have him here tonight to discuss his latest bewilderment. Um, thank you so much. And I will see you all at the end. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so, um, I just want to say, um, first of all, just what a privilege and pleasure it is to have been asked to speak to you about uh, your incredible book, Bewilderment. I, I had a just a, a lovely moment. I tuned in to watch the announcement of the Booker shortlist in real time and, and was also reading the chat as I was doing so. And when your book was announced, unfortunately, the I don't know if you were there, the person who was talked about, it was supposed to talk about your book, had a garbled microphone and uh, Perfect. they had to circle back to you when they had fixed the technical problems. But in the chat, people were saying, you know, I'm so excited. When does the book come out? You know, have you read it? Has anybody read it? And I thought, oh, me, I've read it. So you know, that was, it, it's ahead. interesting to me, you, you're mentioning the book or reminds me, um, 
I, you know, I've I've wanted to meet you for years, and you uh, when you were uh, uh, shortlisted for uh, we're all completely beside ourselves. It was the first year that Americans uh, was. were uh, uh, considered for the prize. And my novel, Orfeo, was on the long list. It didn't make it to the short list. But, you know, I had this sense of like my main interest in going on to the short list would be to, you know, to get a chance to oh. spend a little time with you. When, when Point right. Reyes asked me, you know, when Point Reyes asked me who would I like to have as my interlocutor, I immediately said you, and and you know I'll just say this for the audience. You know there are so many you know reasons that this conversation makes sense. Um, Karen, Karen has published you know hugely accomplished work in a lot of different genres. Um, she is a true science fiction writer, but she is also a true belles lettres writer. Um, sh her her work shows enormous interest. And concern for the relations between humans and and more than humans. There's so many reasons why I thought this would be a neat conversation. And also, you know, she is a West Coast writer, which means when I hear in the Eastern Standard Time, four hours ahead of you all, start to fall asleep, she's going to be like as bright as a daisy. <laughs> she's gonna be able to play with the well, that's just lovely. Thank you so much. I, I didn't know any of that. I had no idea that you had read me, and I am so flattered. Um, and absolutely, you know, when I read um, books like Overstory and Bewilderment, I see um, somebody who is obsessed with a lot of the same things that I am obsessed with and handling them with such brilliance and, um, and acuity and, and heart that... Um, you know, these, these these are my kind of books for sure. Um, but I thought we would start maybe by um, hearing you read a little bit. I think everybody likes to hear how the book sounds in the author's voice. I know I do. So if you don't yeah, mind. Terrific. Not at all. And uh, I, I should say, uh, this is not my cabin in the woods behind me. Uh, <laughs> I. Uh, I'm probably the last person in North America to to use video teleconferencing. Uh, I ha I have had the perfect excuse over the last year and a half that I live in Southern Appalachia in the mountains, and the broadband broadband is not sufficient for any kind of uh, streaming. Uh, that excuse uh, broke down when it came time for my author's uh, events promoting this book. So my publishers have imprisoned me in this hotel room in Knoxville about an hour from my house. Um, and I've been uh, holed up here in the bunker doing interviews and events uh, for the last several days. Uh, so that's what you see behind you. I mention it because uh, it's very atmospheric lighting. So I may struggle a little bit in, in reading the, uh, the tiny letters on this page. I picked a passage right near the beginning, actually, this is page four, uh, partly because uh, the closer you are to the beginning, the less you need to establish, and partly because these couple of pages, in a nutshell, uh, summarize the, the primary protagonists of the book and the, the heart of the dramatic uh, conflict that propels the book toward its, its crisis. Um, the book concerns uh, Theo Byrne, an astrobiologist in his late 30s, who has lost his wife about two years before the start of the novel. And his nine-year-old, very intense, uh, very unusual, uh, terrified and obsessed and behaviorally uh, volatile son, uh, nine-year-old son, Robin. Uh, and in these two pages, this is, you know, the book is told in the first person. Um, and th in these two pages, Theo is speculating about um, Robin and the, the challenge uh, that Robin presents to him. I never believed the diagnoses the doctors settled on my son. When a condition gets three different names over as many decades, when it requires two subcategories to account for completely contradictory symptoms, 
when it goes from non-existent to the country's most commonly diagnosed childhood disorder in the course of one generation, when two different physicians want to prescribe three different medications, there's something wrong. My Robin didn't always sleep well. He wet the bed a few times a season and it hunched him over with shame. Noises unsettled him. He liked to turn the sound way down on the television, too low for me to hear. He hated when the cloth monkey wasn't on its perch in the laundry room above the washing machine. He poured every dollar of allowance into a trading card game, collect them all, but he kept the untouched cards in numeric order in plastic sleeves in a special binder. He could smell a fart from across a crowded movie theater. He'd focus for hours on minerals of Nevada or the kings and queens of England, anything in tables. He sketched constantly and well, laboring over fine details lost on me. Intricate buildings and machines for a year, then animals and plants. His pronouncements were off the wall mysteries to everyone except me. He could quote whole scenes from movies even after a single viewing. He rehearsed memories endlessly and every repetition of the details made him happier. When he finished a book he liked, he'd start it again immediately from page one. He melted down and exploded over nothing but he could just as easily be overcome by joy. On rough nights when Robin retreated to my bed, he wanted to be on the side farthest from the endless terrors outside the window. His mother had always wanted the safe side too. He daydreamed, had trouble with deadlines, and yes, he refused to focus on things that didn't interest him. But he never fidgeted or dashed around or talked without stopping. And he could hold school for hours with things he loved. Tell me what deficit matched up with all that. What disorder explained him? The suggestions were plentiful, including syndromes linked to the billions of pounds of toxins sprayed on the country's food supply each year. His second pediatrician was keen to put Robin on the spectrum. I wanted to tell the man that everyone alive on this fluke little planet was on the spectrum. That's what a spectrum is. I wanted to tell the man that life itself is a spectrum disorder, where each of us vibrated at some unique frequency in the continuous rainbow. Then I wanted to punch him. I suppose there's a name for that too. Oddly enough, there's no name in the DSM for the compulsion to diagnose people. When his school suspended Robin for two days and put their own doctors on the case, I felt like the last reactionary throwback. What was there to explain? Synthetic clothing gave him hideous eczema. His classmates harassed him for not understanding their vicious gossip. His mother was crushed to death when he was seven. And his beloved dog died of confusion a few months later. What more reason for disturbed behavior did any doctor need? Watching medicine fail my child, I developed a crackpot theory. Life is something we need to stop correcting. My boy was a pocket universe I could never hope to fathom. Every one of us is an experiment and we don't even know what the experiment is testing. My wife would have known how to talk to the doctors. Nobody's perfect, she liked to say, but man, we all fall short so beautifully. Thank you. That was just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, you know, uh, to me, the, you know, the sort of the central issue that your book poses is sort of how, how you you survive in this world as an open-hearted, attentive, empathetic person 
and how you raise a child to be all those things and uh, help them survive in this world. So it, it seems to me that that's a complicated and um, enormous question. And, and I'm not going to ask you too much about it because I, it's one of those questions I feel where the whole book, it would be your answer. If I, if I asked you to speak about it, the best thing you could say to me is, well, read the book. Um, so I'm going to start with something much simpler, which is the title. I had, um, I had a memory from Overstory. So I went back and looked at it. And there is a line in Overstory where you're talking about bewilderment and you talk about uh, the dead metaphor at the heart of the word. And I figured that your thinking was probably something similar when you chose that as your title. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I did want to, uh, before I, I, I address that, uh, just to your initial observation about the book being a story about how, you know, how you can survive a, a world with the degree of intense empathy and identification that, that Robin feels and how you would parent a child like this. And of course, the book, you know, the, the, the local crisis of parenting a child whose behavior uh, is often unmanageable it, it, is, you know, only only a kind of particular instance of, of what I think is now an epidemic of childhood mental disorder that's based on eco trauma and a. a a, a degree of depression and a degree of uh, despair and, and uh, disorientation that seems to be steadily growing, you know, in children of all ages. And w in, in these opening pages, you know, with, with Theo uh, pushing back against the medicalization of his son, there should be a lot of anxiety on the part of the reader saying, you know, is this right? You know, is he doing the right thing? Uh, you know, what it, you know, it, it, is he just sort of denying uh, the, the expert decisions about his son? And I think that tension carries through forward into the book and it sets in motion a lot of, a lot of crisis and, and the, there are consequences to Theo's decision. Um, but it's not really about the rightness or wrongness about the decision. It's about the intractable and unstable and perilous endless sets of dramatic crises that are that are facing parents who have to try to raise ch children in a deranged world so with regard to um to the question of the title i've wanted to write a novel called bewilderment for easily for 20 years um and my love of it goes back to an essay that uh the great um doctor physician uh, essayist Lewis Thomas once wrote. Uh, it's called On Matters of Doubt. And he was he was talking about uh, C.P. Snow's two cultures. And he was very disturbed by, by this idea that we were becoming two very different kinds of societies, the science-inflected uh, society and the humanist-inflected society and the, and the and never the twain shall meet. And Thomas desperately, you know, he's writing this uh, this essay called On Matters of Doubt, trying to find a common denominator between these different ways of knowing the world. And he ends up saying, you know, I, I think I found one. I think I found something that all the sciences share and all the humanities share and all the arts share. It's a kind of bedrock condition of them all. It's, just, it's called bewilderment. And I just loved that. And, you know, of course, he's, he's reaching not, he's reaching beyond the ordinary sense of the word, meaning confusion or disorientation. This book is certainly about two very disoriented and bewildered lost boys, the father and the son. But T Thomas is reaching beyond that to the original sense of the word, meaning I am put back into the wild world here uh, in, a, in a relationship with the unknown and uh, and that's not an altogether bad thing. And it is also this bewildering uh, that's at the heart of this story too. 
And I'll tell you, I came back to the word, if this isn't giving, <laughs> giving you far more uh, than you wanted for this question, but when, when I read about this odd technology, uh, I think it was about 2013 that I came across you know, the first references that I remember to decoded neurofeedback, which is a therapy now that's been in use for more than a decade. It's still, it's still developing, it's still in its infancy, but it has to do with using fMRI to create uh, recordings of uh, the neural patterns of people who are, are engaged in an activity or learning a task or uh, participating in an emotional state, and then using a second round of fMRI to train a person in real time to try to emulate that neural state. I had this eerie sense that what they were describing was a kind of machine mediated telepathy and, or, you know, as I come to call it in the novel, a kind of empathy machine. And I thought this, this technology could be the basis for a story about a, a, the ability to rapidly increase your emotional intelligence as Robin does in this book. He, he, he goes through the training and he rapidly goes from this state of, you know, um, behavioral chaos to, to a very different kind of, a, a very much greater, uh, much more self-possessed uh, boy. And I, as I was thinking of this idea of having this machine that could train you in emotional intelligence, I remembered uh, uh, Flowers for Algernon, that old, you know, classic chestnut. Um, you are anticipating um, all my questions. I was gonna oh ask no. you. <laughs> That's all right. I know I was going to yeah. ask when you first, when you first encountered Flowers for Algernon and, um, you know, because it, it obviously had an impact on you. And um, uh, uh, how long ago, how old were you when you first read it? And um, how, how recently how have you reread it? Well, that's, that's actually a more germane question. But um, I, I was not much older than Robbie. Um, I, I think I was 11 when I first came across the, the story. So it was a short story first, and then it, you know, he rewrote it as a novel, and of course it was later made into a film. But I went back to look at it as, as I, when I realized that I was somehow, you know, recreating this childhood memory, not for in, intellectual or cognitive enhancement, the way that Flowers for Algernon is, you know, this, um, this experimental intervention that allows a character to rapidly become, you know, uh, raise their IQ as you, as you would, you would have said back in the, in the fifties and sixties. Um, but you know, that I was telling this parallel thing for a, a different human capacity altogether. I went back to look at the story and I discovered in Keyes's epigraph that he uses a passage from uh, Plato's Republic where uh, Plato is talking about the allegory of the cave. And, you know, we're all shackled in the dark cave, looking at the wall of shadows and mistaking the wall of shadows for the real thing. And you know, one of us gets loose and goes outside and realizes, you know, we've been trapped in this uh, simulacrum and there's an actual world out here and I gotta go tell the others and goes back into the cave and that doesn't go so well. Um, but the, the epigraph, the, the passage from, from Plato uh, that has to do with leaving the cave and, and going back into it is something like in English, in the most famous English translation, it's something like the mind, like the eye, knows two kinds of bewilderment, one going into the light and one coming back. Oh, out. that's really nice, yes. Well, as I said, yeah, uh, I think you have maybe uh, at least hinted at answers to some of the other questions that I already had. One of them was going to be, um, and maybe you can just expand on it a bit, is, um, that my sort of suspicion, uh, you know, that you, you, you uh, obviously you use a lot of science in, in your work, and that my suspicion was that, that often uh, some sort of scientific innovation or study that you have found 
is the thing that starts you on a novel. Um, and, and so I wondered, uh, first of all, I had no idea um, that, the, that the kind of brain training that is in your book is something that is actually being worked on, that it isn't um, all completely uh, science fictional future technology. Um, but, um, but is that kind of the, the thing that started you on this book, the, um, the, the thinking about what, what that in, entails and, and what the um, consequences of a kind of technology like that might be? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say that, that uh, I have been thinking about uh, the ramifications of, of, of that since 2013. Something that makes this book a little different, though, uh, is that once once I bring that technology on as a kind of plot device, it doesn't actually blossom into part of the story in the way that certain scientific themes have in in my previous books. That is, this you know this novel doesn't take neuroscience as part of its narrative texture. You're not asked to enter into that world. Uh, uh, no, it's a very intimate, personal yeah. story. It does stay It does stay on the protagonist. If there is a science... Um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm being told by a reader to go back to no headphones. That the sound was better. I thought part of the, um, the signal breaking up might have been caused by feedback on my end. Is this better now? Um, okay, yeah, just got confirmation on that. Um, so I'm just going to soldier through the, the, the signal break, breakups here. If there is a science that does come a little bit more into the texture of the story, it's, it's Theo's science of astrobiology. Again, it's, it's not a deep dive into this. The, the book itself doesn't require great excursions on the part of the reader into the technical esoterica of the discipline. But I was fascinated by this very young discipline, very rapidly growing discipline that really takes as its subject the largest questions about the potentials and the affordances and the likelihood of life. Um, Are you yes, familiar? I'm Sorry, I've, got, I've put a cough drop in, so that's going to be an unpleasant thing to see. I'm sorry. Um, are you familiar with Ursula Le Guin's book, Changing Planes? No, I, I, I have read her uh, uh, quite a bit, but of course she was quite prolific. Yes, many, many, many books. Um, yeah. Well, this one is just she um, she imagines one planet after another in, in the book, mm. and it's just a, a dazzling feat of imagination. She's very focused um, on political and social uh, constructs in, in these um extraterrestrial sorts of societies but um but your book made me think of it because it's you've got that same um extravagant imagination even though you're, you're focused more on biology and 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 the actual um uh, what's necessary for life um less so than the than the political um structures that may grow but uh, but it i was similarly dazzled just by um how and here's another one and here's another yeah. one and here's another one i thought they were wonderful you know i wish i had known about this book because i tried to find everything that i could that uses this technique of serial imagination and the planetary romance you know the episodic almost picaresque approach to, to voyaging across the universe um and of course, I'm sure Le Guin knew, you know, this sort of great font from the uh, early part of the 20th century, which is Olaf Stapledon's uh, Star Maker. Right. It's one of the most, the, one of the wildest books you'll ever read. Uh, talk about endless imagination. I think a mutual friend of ours, Kim Stanley Robinson, once said that there's an entire science fiction novel plot possibility on every page of, of Star Maker. Um, he, he, he has no concern at all for, for character or plot or 
anything. He's just, it's just an excuse to keep thinking about how life might unfold differently and how it, it might reveal stranger and stranger plans the farther from Earth we get. And of course, there are writers like Italo Calvino or Alan Lightman who have played with this form, you know, the short, you know, one or two page. And I've always been attracted to it as a as a spur to the imagination, as a as a kind of playful um, device that can put us into you know these expansive spaces. But it has a limitation too, which is it's not primarily developmental. And when we use narrative to its full power. It's often the appealing thing for a lot of readers is often that sense of exposition and rising action and climax and- and plot, 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 plot. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> forward chaining of choices and consequences. Um, and, I, and I thought, how could I do this where I can have my cake and eat it too, where I can use this form that's that I love so much and is such a, you know, an imaginative catalyst and yet not give up on the pleasures of plot. And it occurred to me as I was learning about these two guys and, and trying to inhabit them, father and son, that one of the things that calms Robin down in after his mother's death is for his father simply to spend some time with him at night in some shared imaginative space, the classic bedtime story. But of course, when your father is an astrobiologist, the classic bedtime story turns into a walk across the universe. And so when you, when the reader first sees one of these planets uh, drop down into the middle of this domestic realist story, it's a bit of a shock. But little by little, you, you realize this is the way that father and son have to talk to each other. It's a way of thinking about the grand anxieties and hopes and fears that they both have, but it's also that each planet that they visit is has tucked inside it some kind of reflection of the crisis that's confronting them at that point in the, in the unfolding story, in the forward motion of the dramatic story. Yeah, I think it's beautifully done, but, but it's also, you know, to me at least, and, and I think to Robin, you know, it, it's a comforting bedtime story about the persistence of life, the proliferation of life, the, you know, um, something to set against the um, extinctions that Robin is, um, is is seeing and is so terrified right. by. Uh, just just a, right. uh, um, and and also, you know, opens up the great. Um, science fictional question of Fermi's paradox of um, which uh, Robin is very focused on why why do none mm -hmm. of them want to talk to us if there are right. so many places out there why right. do none of them want to talk to us right so that that uh, Karen's alluding for those in the audience uh, who aren't quite as as geeky as your two panelists of uh, <laughs> uh, that there's a there's a story about Enrico Fermi in the in the lunchroom at Los Alamos in the early 50s. It, it, it's something 52 or 54, something like that. I don't know if you remember, Karen, but um, I don't. The, the idea is that he was being told by colleagues about the new discoveries and the new consensual belief about just how old the universe is and just how large it is. And of course, it's gotten older and larger since then. I, you know, the, the rough numbers now are uh, you know, 14 billion years, you know, th three or, you know, three times older than the earth. And at least on the order of a hundred billion galaxies, each of which has on the order of a hundred billion or more stars. And we now know, you know, with evidence only in the last few decades confirming that each of these planets probably has at least uh, each of these stars ha probably has at least one planet. So with all that real estate and all that time, Fermi stopped in the middle of lunch and said, so where is everybody? And oddly, we're still asking, so where is everybody? And not just about intelligent life, 
but any sign of life anywhere we have yet to detect it which is remarkable given the you know the power of our instruments um, and part of the question of the book as father and son make their journeys around the universe is and you you hear it in the opening pages of the book as well would it make any difference to us if we discover tomorrow that yes it's everywhere the universe wants life or if we go on decade after decade and still get confronted with the great silence would either one of those raise our own level as a species raise our own level of emotional intelligence sufficient to know sufficiently for us to know what an ungodly lucky thing we have here and would that change our sense of who we are and where we are and what we owe this place i have so many questions that, that i'm uh, i'm watching the time tick away um <laughs> so let, let me ask you this one because it, it it kind of harkens back a little to what you said about um the two cultures that um that when i came into um science fiction when i started publishing uh there was a a, a growing split in the field between the humanists which was kim stanley robinson largely and the cyberpunks which was william gibson and bruce sterling and you know the cyberpunks um tended to be urban in their visions mm -hmm. and you know very focused on uh on politics as a function of corporations and a profit um and um and uh but i i um was trying to sort of determine what where i thought the real split was and i think it's this and i'm not sure where you would fall on this it, it seemed to me that that um that the cyberpunks not only did not believe in the efficacy of activism but they didn't like political activists that they you know they were sort of holier than thou um people and um and so there's there's a, a suspicion a distrust uh, and maybe uh, maybe even further an antipathy towards the people who are actually trying to make the world a better place. And the humanists believe in at least the value of that attempt, if not in the um, results that it may bring about. And and I'm not sure where you fall on that. So I would like to know. It's a, It's a super interesting question. And it's come up a lot already, even in the earliest readings of this book. And with people's response to the overstory because i think there is also a great discomfort on the part of literary fiction you know belletristic fiction toward a book that has a moral stance uh we we you know if you come up through a classic mfa program you're taught that the author should never uh make a position known or should never resolve a moral ambiguity between characters uh it, you know that the that the best that, that, that you you serve your readers best by allowing incommensurable positions to seem sim somehow sympathetic uh, and you know to 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 uh to see life on earth or social our social organizations as not being able to appeal to an external authority in order to resolve uh, moral dispute. And, and when, when there's a book like The Overstory <laughs> that says we've gone wrong and we have, to, we have to find a new kind of consciousness, that's, that's jarring for a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it will be, um, you know, the, the case with this book as well. Uh, it will be a struggle for some readers to say th that this book seems to want to tell a story that furthers moral clarity rather than merely setting up a contestation that's up to the, the reader to, to determine. There may be another kind of 
division in science fiction that's germane and has a bearing on this, my answer that I just gave. I know that, that such a division also occurs in other genres uh, and in character-driven fiction. And that's the division between, the, let's say, the communitarians, the people who believe um, that we are part of a big reciprocal interdependent network of agents that go way beyond our species and the human exceptionalists, those people whose stories basically might never even mention the possibility of an existence outside of the human species. And this is th th that is the context, contest that I think we're struggling with right now as we begin to realize that the cataclysms that we've released on the world have come about in large part because of a culture that says we are not accountable to anyone but our own mission. Yes. And yeah. Yes, and I, you know that um, I was headed sort of in that direction too, and, and, and because I was going to ask you, and you know, I guess betraying my own sensibilities, it seems so clear to me that um, that 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 it's it's all of us, you know, that it's a planet wide network that um, that has to be protected at at every point. Why the people who feel as I do, and why the people who um, like Ali in your book are terribly concerned about how uh, non-human uh, animals are treated? Why are they so often seen as sentimental, yeah. um, childish? Maybe you know, not not. Why? You, you know. I it's astonishing, and she she acknowledges it in the book in one of the flashback scenes that Theo has. Um, they think we're crazy, right? Uh, and you know, I I thought a lot about uh, we are all completely beside ourselves while I was working on this book. Um, who has that capacity to give the sacredness? to something larger than us, right? And not be, not appear as a crackpot to this uh, individualist, uh, you know, commodity mediated, uh, neoliberal human exceptionalist culture that we've built. This is a gross oversimplification, but when you were talking about um, uh, the cyberpunks versus the humanists. You can also see that a lot of this has to do with our relationship to our prosthetic parts, to the technologies that we keep using to hugely extend what it means to be human and our yes. capacity as human. Yes, and, are, and, and our, our feelings about our actual physical bodies and you know how right. satisfied we are just to, to be uh, meat and... Uh, right. Right, and 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 that's you know in in a nutshell, there is a portion of uh, of humankind that is so anxious about our materiality, our animality, our mortality, right? That every new technology that hugely increases the capacity and power of humanity seems like an invitation to say, "Hey, we can do it alone. Hey, we can get." to the singularity, you know, we can, you know, we can get, we can fix all the design flaws of life and, uh, you know, finally just have it the way that we imagine, you know, the total freedom and autonomy and non-accountability and non-ephemerality that, you know, that is so attractive to imagine. Um, and, you know, this, this culture uh, this sort of Silicon Valley notion that just hold out for a little bit longer and we will be able to beat even death. Yeah. And on the other side of the equation, this sort of, uh, you know, the interbeing, uh, uh, the, the reciprocal view of humans that, we, you know, we are one of many, many neighbors and dependent on unbelievable amounts of uh, 
other species in order to have the existence that we have, uh, that side, you know, is is saying, look, death is the mother of beauty, as Wallace Stevens says. It's the greatest design feature that life could possibly come up with because it is the engine of all evolutionary creation. And let's stop thinking about ourselves as stopping when we stop and stopping, let's stop being terrified about the end of meaning with the end of our individual existence. And let's start empathizing with this huge experiment out there that goes so far beyond us. Again, that's deep in this novel of bewilderment. And it's very much the journey that Robbie makes uh, beyond his, the limits of his own individuality. I can see the police have arrived. I know, I have so much else I wanted to say, but that was such a beautiful final statement that I feel maybe I should shut up. Oh, this is not the role I want to be playing in this conversation. But actually what I'm here to do is uh, elevate some audience questions. So also if more conversation flows from there, um, Karen, feel free to jump in. You, you, get, you get to do that. All right. Um, and I did see that some scrolled by already. Yeah, wow. I've got, I've, I've captured them. So I'm gonna try, I'm gonna do my best to uh, get everyone's questions answered here. Um, so this question starts with reading the story of a handful of your other novels. And I'm just curious how you would describe the evolution of your writing from your early novels to the old overstory and bewilderment in terms of the schism you've noticed between fiction with a moral view and <coughs> fiction that issues that. So how has your writing evolved through your work? So Bewilderment is my 13th novel. I published my first novel in 1985. Um, and that's, you know, 36 years of publishing. Um, and it's been a long and winding road. And I think any anything that I try to do to make it seem like a coherent and a simple narrative is just kind of gross simplify, oversimplification. <laughs> but I, I will say that I probably have made, you know, personally, the journey from cyberpunk toward humanism in, in Karen's dichotomy that, I, as a, as a, as a young writer, um, I was fascinated just in that sort of deist way of saying, well, let's put all these things in motion and then step back and watch them go. That kind of, uh, clockmakers, uh, universe. And I think it, as I got older and explored different disciplines and their, and their bearing on people and what we, you know, what we think the human is, uh, as these other disciplines have have exploded and become, uh, you know, more deeply uh, ingrained in the way that we look at the world, a, a gradual sense of wanting to relocate meaning has come into my work, um, a, a realization that a lot of our culture and a lot of the arts that this culture produces has been colonized by this idea that meaning is a purely private act that you do for and by yourself. And in the nine times out of 10, it's, you know, the, all that you can do is simply try to make your own life a little bit richer and, uh, you know, to be kind, but to continue to grow, you know. And I started, you know, it was about 10 years ago, uh, or maybe I see the signs of it in Echo Maker, you know, even earlier than that where I started to think, it's not right. You know, what if that is just a, a, a sort of weird cultural formation that has to do with the economic and technological principles that, you know, that, that we've, you know, interpolated in, in the present. What if meaning is out there? Not in, not in old fashioned religious sense, but what if life wants things? What if there is agency in affordance in the, the life experiment, wouldn't it be a different kind of satisfaction and different kind of joy? Wouldn't it lower I, our anxieties if we could get there? And you know, the more I thought about that, the more I thought this is a very old idea. 
This is really about going to kind of pre-modern cultural formations. And Le Guin did it many, many times in many different ways. In fact, the, 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 the science fiction writers never entirely gave up that sense that we could attach ourselves to larger processes out there and that that in itself was a solution to so many of the anxieties that commodity mediated cultures of accumulation have never been able to solve. How smart is he? <laughs> that was just incredible. That's thank you. <laughs> And it seems like the appropriate bookend to just every moment of this conversation. We should just chime in with, how smart was that? <laughs> Let's, uh... well, you, 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 you forget that, you know, um, uh, I've come out of the woods uh, where I've, I've spoken to almost nobody for two years. And now all of a sudden, it's like I got to get my act together <laughs> and I have to start talking to people again. And, yeah, so a couple of weeks of practice you know, behind me now. Well, yeah, uh, one of the things I wanted to hear about was living in the woods, but we'll mm. we'll save it for another. It's not a short conversation, yeah. so we'll save it. Well, this is a good segue to another question that we have from the audience, um, which is, you've written such a wide variety of books on scientific issues, climate change, civil rights, and music. How do you go about becoming an expert in such a variety of topics? Yeah, you know, I... I I did want to be a lot of different things when I was young. I had a lot of interests and a lot of pleasures and 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 a good variety of skills. And I was a lucky uh, a lucky guy, and I was very claustrophobic um, at the idea of having to select a major, for instance, because that's like fifteen majors that I don't get to to do. You know, so every every specialization was a, a kind of uh, closing off of so many other doors. And until I stumbled on this writing thing where you never had to specialize, you know, you could every few years, you could reinvent yourself and, you know, take on a kind of different discipline and a different way of looking at the world. It was the perfect solution for the generalist's temperament. And that's, I feel an affinity with, with Karen in that regard. If you look oh, at the books and you know, how she's totally reinventing herself every single time out. Absolutely. Um, it's it's yeah. the great joy of my life that anything that suddenly catches my interest, I can I can stop everything else and I can think about that and I can read about that and um, I can try to learn something new. So this process of of doing the research that the question wants to know how do you how do you make yourself conversant in a field, you know that that is actually what drives the writing pleasure for me uh it and it it doesn't it doesn't feel like work i don't want it to end um and sometimes too much of it gets into the books for a lot of readers tastes you know a lot of readers say wow this is you know a lot more about uh you know um uh business or artificial intelligence or classical music or trees than I than I signed on for when I picked up a, something that said a novel on the cover. But you no, know, it's to me it's it's the, the pleasure of reading as well as of, of writing. For Overstory, I read um, over 120 books on trees, just single volume studies of uh, on trees. And I'm still do, reading, you know, th th that book was published in 2018 and I have an entire bookshelf in the upstairs bedroom of my house devoted to trees. It just, the, the, the writing was almost incidental to that sort of amateur passion uh, that takes hold of you. And, and you know, it, it's just this wild gift to be able to vicariously for a few years anyway, say, well, there's a road not taken that I took a little bit, you know, a few steps down. Yeah. Well, we have a few more questions that I'm gonna try to honor them all. So if you don't mind speaking just a little bit about the overstory, because I'm sure that's what brought a lot of people together here. Uh, this question is, do you ever wonder what happens to the people you created in the overstory? Sure, sure. Um, and, you know, one challenge for a novelist 
um, that I was really aware of in that book, because that book had so many characters, was where do you stop a, a person's trajectory? You know, um, because what their story seems to mean is always retroactively informed by what the last word seems to be. It's a weird f function of our of our narrative compulsion. Um, Daniel Kahneman in, in Thinking Fast and Slow talks about this as the peak end uh, um, phenomenon, you know, that we judge an experience by the peak of the experience and also the end of the experience. And I think we look at the narrative arc of a character in a story and we think, oh, I remember when this happened because it was just so out there. But I also remember what happened at the end. And we get to the end and then all of a sudden we go all retroactively back and we say, oh, so that's what that voyage, what that journey meant. So yeah, you, 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 it's not just do I now wonder what happened to him after the last page, but it's during the course of writing, you're saying, is that the last page? Or is there another page beyond that? Or, or do I need to stop it sooner? Because everything is different once that curtain comes down. Um, I, I know, uh, you know to, to in, invoke Stan Robinson again, you know, he said, you left your cast so bloody at the end of that book, you know, everybody gets hit so hard, you know, and it, it, it hadn't occurred to me the truth of that. But of course, um, there is also for many of the characters at that very end, just a little in their own understanding of the world, just a little bit of that sense of there is still a trajectory, there is still something happening beyond this, this harvesting, this catastrophe. And that, to me, uh, I was looking, you know, at the end of that book, I was looking at a way of saying, yes, there, there are cataclysmic ca uh, uh, consequences in these people's lives. And yes, they do get bloodied. But there are many of them that are saying, there's another page, you can't see it yet. Well, and I'm going to end with this question, which was one of the first to come through in the chat, which I find um, impressive in its boldness. So I'm just going to read it as it's written. Hi, Richard. One question. Do you believe that there is an essence of a person separate from their memories and experiences? This is actually a yes, no, or maybe question. If you'd like to answer <laughs> this, yes. you can say a little more. Yes. If like to as well. And I, I will answer if Karen also has to answer, and then I think we can make Molly. <laughs> so read it one more time, so I make sure that I that I'm not taking for granted any of the assumptions in the question. Absolutely. Um, do you believe that there is an essence of a person separate from their memories and experiences? Is it cheating to say that when my brothers and sisters and I are together in the same room, that the essence of my mother and my father are still there within in what we do? Um, that's that's one way to answer the question. I think the questioner probably wants a more literal sense of the soul. And I do come down on the materialist side of things in that regard. I, I think w when we die, we're dead. That is the, the processes that generate this, you know, pocket universe inside my own head stop. And I'm not sure what, go, what could go on beyond that, except in other agents. Um, and accepting the consequences of how I have been in the world. And in that sense, the trace is, is endless. Um, but, I, you know, I also think there's, there's nothing that's happening inside me that hasn't happened an infinite amount of times inside other people in different combinations. So I don't mind, it doesn't seem tragic to me to say this one particular combination is no more. In fact, you know, when you think of life, you know, it, you know, David Hume knew this, that we're always dying. You know, there's, 
the, the guy who wrote that first novel in, in you know, 1985, I, you know, I can hardly recognize him. You know, I'm glad he did it because I wouldn't be able to do it. You know what I'm saying? That, uh, that there is, when you accept that we are these aggregate processes that are, you know, constantly in motion, we're, we're just rivers, you know, we're just torrents. And, you know, the, the who I am is so contingent on on who I'm with, you know, uh, t tonight talking to, to, to Karen was a totally different me than the conversation that I had two hours ago with the, with another host. So it shouldn't be a matter of, of terror to us if it, if I'm right, and there is no essence that circulates beyond the, 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 the carrying capacity because we're always we're always becoming something else. Why should why should death be anything different? I will, um, since I've been challenged to do so, I, I yeah. will also say that um, that I believe that death is death, and uh, um, I will, uh, you know, the joke will be on me if it turns out not to be the case. I, I will laugh and laugh if. Uh, it turns out that I go on after my death in some way, but, uh, but I it's don't funny. expect to. Go it's ahead. almost like Pascal's wager uh, stood on its head. If yeah. we're wrong, great. <laughs> <Bring it on. laughs> um, well, but, I, say, I see a question here that, that I would love to answer. Oh, okay. do you? Yeah. yeah. So Sophie uh, uh, Reinders asks, why does Patricia Westerford kill herself in the end of Overstory? And my answer is go back and read the section again. Yeah, D does she? But um, is she, uh, so, it's, it's, uh, is she? It's not Schrodinger's. Alone. It's Schrodinger's cat. Yes, so, Sophia is not alone in reading it, it that way. But if you if go back slowly and look at it again, and you see actually the world does split, but the this world quite distinctly says in this world she commits unsuicide. And I wanted to say it because I made some mistakes, obviously, in the way that I built that scene, because a lot of people came away from thinking from the book thinking she does do herself in. Yeah. The question should be, why is it necessary to split the world like that and say, hypothetically, down this pathway, she does do herself in? And I think it's because in the moment of despair is the moment of the recapitulation of hope. You actually have to go all the way down that pathway in order for the decision to make unsuicide actually have uh, uh, power and um, a penalty to it. You know, there has to be stakes. Um, so, so yeah, uh, have, have another look. Uh, I, I think you'll, you'll see something interesting going on in that passage. I think you'll feel better. You'll feel better about the whole thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, this conversation seems impossible to end, but I I think what we've just determined is that it it goes on <laughs> in, in <laughs> well. various formats infinitely. Here I we did, are. We're so I lucky to have been tell, here. I did tell Rick that I was going to ask him one final question. It's a very quick one. What is your favorite bird? Prepare <laughs> an answer. So uh, for, for those who haven't read the book or, or who think they might, it's a, it's a great motif in bewilderment. Um, uh, Theo's wife is a birder. The, the, um, and it, their first date is a bird date. And he's so embarrassed when all that he comes up with as she's naming these warblers and, you know, uh, uh, you know, exotic species, you know, tr transients, uh, the, the, you know, he sees this flash of orange and he gets so excited and he says, oh, it's just a robin. And she turns to him and says, the robin's my favorite bird. <laughs> and I, I, you know, that that becomes a very, very important kind of motif. And in fact, they name their boy Robin because of this first exchange on their first date. Boy, I, 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 now I'm having this uh, generalist's crisis all over again. <laughs> I tell you my favorite bird, that's 50 favorite birds that I leave you know, by the side of the road. I sleep out on the porch 
in the Smokies when I can, when the nights aren't too cold. And some among my favorite birds are birds I've never seen, but I hear at night. Uh, there are three kinds of owls. And then there is a lunatic night bird near my house. There's a nest somewhere. I've never seen it. I may never see it. It's a whooper will. And for those of you who've ever heard, I put it in bewilderment because it's one of my favorite all-time birds, although I've never seen it. When a whooper will starts singing, it goes absolutely nuts. It perseverates. It'll, it'll, it goes, whoop, 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 and it could do it thousands of times in a row. And to me, when I lie and I wake up at 2 a.m. and this crazy bird is launching into this song, endless repetition. And to me, that's life. Like, what is it doing? Who is it talking to? Why is it saying the same thing over and over? Why are there tiny little differences every time it's, it goes back into that phrase? I just think, yeah, that's my bird. <laughs> Thank you. That's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here. This is, we started uh, by talking about how this is kind of the hardest part of these virtual events is where we've all shared this incredible conversation and then we're suddenly alone in our homes. <laughs> um, so we wish that we were wrapping this up with much more conversation as we stand around and chat and put away folding chairs together. But uh, we hope to do that soon. And next time uh, with both of you, Richard and Karen, thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you. And you can all read the book, which means the evening does not have to end. <laughs> That's a great reminder. So you can purchase uh, Bewilderment at the link below or please from your local independent bookstore. Um, we would just love to see this book out in the world. And I have also linked to Karen Joy Fowler's forthcoming novel in the chat. And uh, we hope to see you all again soon this way or in person. Thank you so much. Thanks Molly. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you. you. Cross paths soon. Good that night was everybody. Such a pleasure. I loved it. it was. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Bye.